that uh, this talk that I'll be giving describes 10 years of different work with a whole variety of collaborators, and indeed, in many cases, by these different collaborators. Uh, let, let me note particularly Holger Hoss, who's a, uh, a colleague of mine at UBC. Um, Frank Hutter is a postdoc of ours who uh, used to be a student. Um, Eugene Noodleman is a, a former uh, student of Yoav's, as was I. He's now at Google. Uh, Yoav Shoham is here. And Ling Shu is a, a PhD student of mine. And his baby didn't do any of the work, but he's cute, so he's in the picture as well. So the motivating question that I'm going to speak about today is how hard is it to solve a given problem in practice, uh, kind of canonically an NP-complete problem, using the best available methods? Now, the best available methods, uh, in my experience, tend to offer no interesting theoretical guarantees. So they tend to have some inputs on which uh, they would have exponential uh, complexity. Nevertheless, they work astoundingly well in practice. So, for example, modern SAT solvers on veri verification problems that people care about, which uh, aren't able to be shown to be a polynomial case, are often able to solve problems on the order of 500 megabytes in size in reasonable amounts of time. So these solvers are, are really complex and can do really well in practice. And, and nevertheless, they also often exhibit exponentially varying performance. For example, varying from on the order of milliseconds to on the order of days, even when problem size is held fixed. And so they seem really to respond very strongly to the structure of an instance. So the question that I want to ask about is, how, how do these solvers work? What makes a problem hard for th these state-of-the-art solvers? And the overall message of the talk is going to be that even in settings where it seems like formal analysis would be hopeless. For example, where an algorithm is a complex black box, something like Cplex, where I'm not even in principle able to look at the algorithm and see what it's even doing inside without disassembling it. And also, even in cases where instance distributions are heterogeneous, richly structured, maybe only given by a set of exemplars, it's nevertheless possible to apply rigorous statistical methods to answer questions about how these methods behave in practice with high levels of confidence. Now let me begin with a disclaimer. Uh, it's my suspicion that many of you here prefer complexity theoretic analysis to statistical methods that aim only to do well in practice. So let me say, uh, even if you're one of these people, uh, you, you may well choose to tune out at some point, but at least don't tune out right at the beginning because I think you should still care about the overall message of this talk. And in particular, I think that you ought to conclude that the fact that statistical methods can be shown again and again to make really reliable predictions about just about anything we throw at them goes to show that there are patterns in algorithm performance that aren't yet captured theoretically. And the kinds of statistical proofs that I'll be showing you today won't amount to those kinds of uh, theoretical descriptions that would be of most interest to you, but I think this whole agenda would give you some ways of moving forward towards uh, finding some starting points that would be theoretically interesting. So let me start with something that I think many people here already know about, and indeed uh, that I was very nicely set up for by the previous talk, so thanks Uri for giving me just, just the right previous talk. Uh, so I want to talk about phase transitions in 3SAT. So it's well known that in uniform random 3SAT, there's a phase transition in the probability of solvability uh, at the clauses to variables ratio of about 4.26. So this is this kind of density parameter that Uri was talking about. And, and this is a, a graph using real data. Uh, this transition gets sharper and sharper as the instance gets bigger and bigger. Uh, here we're using kind of moderate sized instances. And so what happens as the clauses to variables ratio grows from being kind of small to kind of big is we go from instances that are almost surely satisfiable because they're under constraint, because there are many, many solutions to the sad instance, through kind of a sharp transition to instances that are almost surely unsatisfiable because they're over constrained. And uh, what's interesting to me about this story is that uh, there's a corresponding transition in the uh, difficulty of the best solvers in solving these instances. So here's a state-of-the-art solver, uh, KCNFs, running on uh, this, this same data here. And we see that it has a spike in hardness uh, that corresponds directly to that phase transition point. And this was first noticed uh, by uh, kind of a decade, uh, yeah, I guess two decades ago. Um, 
by Cheeseman et al. and then by uh, expanded upon by Salman et al. And so this spawned some enthusiasm for using empirical methods to study algorithm performance because it related a theoretical property of the instances, this phase transition, to something that was true of the best algorithms that were known at the time. Now I want to show you this same data that I summarized here by this graph in uh, its raw form. So here I'm showing you the mean runtime of many different samples at each of these different points. Let me show you all of the samples. So here's, uh, again, on the same axis, uh, KCNF's runtime as I vary the clause to variables ratio. And I've now put a dotted line at this 4.26 point. So uh, this again shows you that same picture, that there's a spike in runtime uh, hardness right at that point. But you can now see that there's also a whole lot of variation that wasn't captured by that picture about the mean. So uh, one thing I want you to conclude here is that while indeed there really is a strong uh, correlation with the clauses to variables ratio, there's clearly also a lot of other stuff going on. Uh, another thing that might jump out at you is that things seem to sort of look different to the left of the line and to the right of the line. Things are a lot more tightly clustered to the right of the line. Um, w one reason why the transition is different is that um, proving satisfiability is in some sense different from proving unsatisfiability because you get to stop as soon as you find a satisfying assignment, but you have to explore the whole tree to show that no unsatisfying assignment exists. Um, that's why the variation is, is kind of smaller over here. Indeed, if I break out these instances by whether or not they were satisfiable, uh, I can see that the, the, regime, the difference in the regimes is even sharper. So these are only the satisfiable instances. And indeed, satisfiable instances exist beyond the phase transition point, but not too far beyond. And if I look at the unsatisfiable instances, there's again this very sharp pattern. How big is the R? Uh, I think these are uh, instances at 300 variables. So, so here kind of overall is where we stand. Um, we can conclude that the probability of solvability correlates very strongly in practice with instance hardness. But we can also see that there's a whole lot of, of residual variance. And let me point out, uh, like most of the graphs I'll be showing you today, I have log scales. And so this variance along the dotted line is pretty enormous. Right? We have uh, things at the phase transition point that took a couple of hundred seconds, and we also have things that took um, a couple of hundreds of seconds. So there, there really is a lot of variation here. So there's clearly a lot more to understanding how this hardness varies than just looking at this clauses to variables ratio. And this leads, uh, led us to the question of whether it's possible to make more accurate predictions. And the idea that we pursued was to use machine learning methods to look more broadly for patterns beyond this kind of simple one-dimensional analysis. So this machine learning approach that we adopted, uh, we called empirical hardness models. Um, it, it began uh, at Stanford with Eugene and Yoav. Um, it's ultimately described in a JACM paper there, which if you're interested by this, might be the first place to look. And then my group at UBC has been pursuing it uh, since then. And I'll be describing mostly this work here um, by people both at Stanford and UBC. So I'll start out by talking about uniform random three set, uh, again following uh, nicely on uh, what Uri led off with. So the idea of an empirical hardness model is to try to find a mapping which predicts how long an algorithm will take to run. So uh, on instances that, that have never been seen before. So the idea is you give me a set of instances D. You can describe that set as a probability distribution like uniform random three set, or you can really give me a set of instances. Then for each instance in the set, I'm going to compute a vector of feature values, uh, which are going to be some kind of properties of the instance that I think might be important to hardness. Uh, I'll, I'll speak more about that in a minute, but uh, the, the kinds of things that already we're talking about in, in the previous talk is one kind of example. And for each instance as well, I'm actually going to run it using the algorithm that I care about and, and observe what the runtime of my algorithm was. Then this gives me a supervised machine learning problem, in particular a regression problem, because I want to predict a continuous quantity in runtime. And I want to find some mapping from the features to runtimes, which is accurate on other instances drawn from the same distribution that I didn't use to construct the mapping. And I want then to go and evaluate my mapping on new instances drawn from this same distribution and see whether I could do a good job about predicting runtime. And if I could, it means that my mapping captures something about how the structural properties of the instance, uh, things that I can measure quickly about the instance, correlate or predict um, how the algorithm actually works in practice. 
as I mentioned, this problem is a regression problem. And over the years, we've tried all sorts of different regression techniques. Um, in the end, uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about which regression methods work. But the high level message is that it doesn't really matter all that much which machine learning method you use. Um, the uh, features that you use are a little bit more important, although we've also found that we didn't have to sweat that too much. I'll tell you about the features on the next slide. Uh, for the first part of the talk, I'm going to consider a very straightforward and tractable method, uh, basis function ridge regression. This is essentially a linear regression with a, a regularizer. Uh, that's the, uh, the ridge that uh, uh, gives us a little bit more numerical stability. And uh, you can understand it as a, a Bayesian prior for the coefficients in the regression being small. And a basis function expansion of that that gives us quadratic features rather than just linear features. So features are able to interact with each other. But again, these details aren't really very important, at least to the, the high level story I want to tell in the talk. So let me tell you about the features, because this is important. So the philosophy that we wanted to adopt here is to sort of throw in everything but the kitchen sink. Take everything that we think might possibly be relevant to predicting an algorithm's hardness, and then let the machine learning approach sort out what actually matters and discard what doesn't. So I don't want to claim to you that everything I'm listing here matters. This is just everything we threw in. So we started from the most obvious stuff that describes problem size, looking at the number of clauses, the number of variables, the clause to variables ratio, taking that variable uh, ratio and offsetting it by 4.26 because we know that number matters and our models are linear. Um, then we look at syntactic properties of the instance, things like um, are clauses mostly negative or mostly positive. We then looked at uh, three different constraint graphs. The first is precisely the factor graphs that we heard about in the last talk, although uh, without the edge coloring. We also looked at a graph that talks about whether two clauses share the same variable. Uh, with a, a negated polarity. And we looked at a graph that talks about whether two variables participate in the same clause. And, and about each of these graphs, we then ask things like, what, what's the uh, variation in the out degree? What, what's the average out degree? What are path lengths in the graph? Just all kinds of different graph properties about these, uh, about these different graphs. We looked at Knuth's estimate for the size of a search space, which is based on performing a small number of probes uh, using random uh, branching on an instance to see at what point you reach a contradiction. And that gives you an estimate, uh, an unbiased but pretty noisy estimate of the log uh, number of nodes in the search space. So we, we took that estimate. We took uh, a popular heuristic, the SADZ heuristic, and looked at how many unit propagations it was able to perform at different depths in the tree. We took local search algorithms, although I, I should say, you know, here I'm looking at SADZ, here I'm looking at local search. This isn't to say these are necessarily the algorithms I'm going to try to describe. These are just ways of extracting a number from the instance. So I looked at local search algorithms and the, at the kind of trajectories they took in the space on very short runs and asked things like, uh, where do they hit plateaus? You know, what's the, what's the difference in size between the first plateau they hit and the plateau they ultimately hit before I cut them off? Or um, what, how, how good a solution do they quickly find when I stop them? Various different statistics of local search runs. Finally, I look at the linear programming relaxation of the integer programming formulation of the satisfiability problem. So I can ask things like how close to integral it is. So I take all of this different stuff and I just sort of throw it all in as features and then I have a regression problem. I do some feature selection to make sure that I don't have numerical problems with having hundreds of features. And eventually, I end up with some kind of model. So what I want to ask is, how good is this model at predicting the runtime of a real SAT solver on whatever instances it is that I care about? And so that's what I can show you here. So this is showing you every dot corresponds to a test instance that wasn't used to train my model, drawn from a uniform random 3SAT uh, with variable ratios, with the ratios ranging from about 3 to about 5. And uh, again, I've got uh, a log scale here. On the x-axis, I'm showing you the actual runtime of my solver. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you the runtime predicted by my model. So the picture that I would like to show you has everything right along this dotted red line. That would mean that my predictions were perfect. And the further away from the red line I get, the worse my predictions are. So for me, this is a pretty good picture. Uh, don't be too misled by there being a couple of outliers. They draw your eye, but there aren't very many of them. Uh, by and large, things are pretty decently clustered around the, uh, the diagonal here. 
Now, one thing you might notice about this picture, it kind of looks like a hot dog on a stick surrounded by mosquitoes. Uh, you might not have quite put it that way to yourself, but you might have noticed that. Um, it, it looks like there are kind of two different things going on in this picture, is my point. And indeed, if I condition on the satisfiability of the, of the instances, which of course my models don't know, uh, I can see, looking only at, at unsatisfiable instances, these are these ones. So I'm doing a really remarkably good job of predicting the runtime of my solver on unsatisfiable instances. And these are satisfiable instances. I'm doing very much less well on them. And that kind of makes sense to me because random orderings, indeed the algorithms themselves are, are randomized, and random choices about which variable to branch on can make a very big uh, difference in whether I get to stop immediately with a satisfiable assignment or not. So I would kind of expect that there's an inherently bigger amount of variance in what I could do with a satisfiable instance. Yeah? So if you mentioned the graph here earlier, the run times on the unsatisfiable instances were fairly tightly concentrated. So how would um, how, do, how, how does this compare to just uh, taking the, the mean or the... Different? That's a good question, right? So, so uh, what you should notice is the amount of variation in actual runtime between the easiest and the hardest unsatisfiable instances, right? Because the constant predictor is going to have everything lined up in a line uh, in the prediction dimension here, right? So it would have everything varying here, so it, it would look like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess I can use the mouse. Uh, so it would have to be um, constant in this dimension, and it would range from this point to this point. So it would be a line that goes all that way, rather than being uh, horizontally, rather than being along the red line. So you have a varying clause to variable ratio in this, right? Right. I mean, here, you know, this x-axis really is the actual runtime of these things. So, so there really was that much variation. There were unsatisfiable instances, I guess going down here, that took about a second, and there were unsatisfiable instances that took about 300 seconds. But are those the same clause to variable ratio? No, I mean, this particular data set has uh, the clauses to variables ratio varying. So it's asking what is the use audience one feature that is the next? Uh, good. So, so let, me, let me get to that. And, and anyway, I don't want to speak only about uh, variable clause to ratio data. So let, let me go on. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. That's a good question. I don't remember whether we did that. Uh, again, this is going to sort of serve as a motivating example for some things that follow, so I, I honestly don't remember whether we did that anymore. You might imagine that that reduces the variance. Um, in a sense, though, uh, it's similar to just getting many different samples from the space, which is what we've done. But you, get a, you might get a narrower top dog to you. you uh, that, that's true. I mean, you might at least get a picture that looks like that. It wouldn't be more accurate when you actually had to make a decision about how long a run was going to take. Um, so one thing that, that I'm interested in, once I start seeing that these things work at all, is to know how is it working? What, what does it tell me about actually what it takes to predict the runtime of uh, a SAT solver? And so we can analyze a model's features to try to figure out uh, what's going on. Now, th the problem is these models are very high dimensional. So you can't just look at the model and get some kind of insight. It's a weighted sum of all kinds of stuff, which is itself very correlated. So the solution is to do subset selection, to try to find the smallest subset model that still does well. Uh, the caveat is that this ends up being a necessary but not sufficient condition for good performance. So I don't know that other subsets wouldn't have worked just as well. I just know that this subset does work very well. And the kinds of things I want to know about this variable size data are whether my models discover the importance of this ratio, if so, in what form uh, there's a dependence, and what other features are important. And here's what I find. So um, first of all, I can see that the clause to variables ratio features are very important. They're showing up all over the place. Um, but not, and not just uh, directly linearly. Uh, and not only the one offset by the uh, the cluster variables ratio uh, threshold, but also this one here. And we also see one feature showing up twice uh, that has to do with uh, the coefficient of variation in the best point found uh, along a local search trajectory. So I just want to sort of leave that as being suggestive and move on. 
Um, now I want to talk about what happens at this transition point. So you might argue we already knew that there was this very important feature. And kind of what you showed me is if you throw in a bunch of junk and, and also gold, you know, your method can find the gold. That's not all that interesting. Let, so let's see what we can do when we don't have that to fall back on. Uh, and so again, notice how much variation there still is. The, the goal here now is to try to explain that variation. Uh, so here's how well we can do on that same solver. Um, definitely not as good, but this is a case where we previously knew nothing. Um, so now we have a fixed problem size uh, right in that hard region, and still the correlation is pretty strong. Again, it's a little bit hard to see with the eye because you can't quite tell what's going on there. But if you look at the, the numerical measures, uh, this is not bad. Um, so what's going on here? Uh, well, now, of course, the uh, clauses to variables feature is not important at all because it's not relevant. Uh, instead, what we see is the local search trajectory features turn out to be very important. So these kind of quick statistics that I can gather about the instance by doing local search are cropping up all over the place. Uh, this estimate due to Knuth about the size of the search tree also turns out to be very relevant. And we also get the, uh, what we call the variable clause graph, the factor graph uh, showing up here. And, and, and particularly the feature that's important is the mean uh, degree of the nodes. Um, so here uh, is the same variable um, closet to ratio picture that I showed you before, but for a different solver. And here I didn't quite nail the hot dog on the stick quite as well, sort of falling off a little bit. Um, th this made us a little bit unhappy, but I, I want to show you this so that I can come back to it in a second. So one thing that we noticed from, uh, from that kind of previous analysis was that the unsat and sat instances seem to be really different from each other. So we had the kind of crazy idea, what if we just tried to build a model that predicted whether an instance was satisfiable or unsatisfiable, and then conditioned on that prediction to make a second prediction about runtime. So we call those hierarchical hardness models. And what's interesting is conditioning on satisfiability, single feature models become sufficient to predict runtime. So we gain almost nothing by all the rest of our features, which wasn't true before. In particular, these local search features, uh, one local search feature, turns out to be all that's needed for a satisfiable instance. And this search space size estimate turns out to be all that's needed for an unsatisfiable instance. Um, and so, uh, first of all, I want to show you it's actually possible um, looking here at fixed ratio three set, so at the point where I can't use the clause to var variables ratio, it's possible to make accurate predictions about whether the instance is satisfiable. So this shows the classifier's output. So most of the time, uh, so the classifier says how confident it is. Most of the time, it's very confident that it's either unsatisfiable or satisfiable. And this shows its accuracy conditional on having made that prediction. And so it's almost entirely accurate in the common cases where it's very confident. So we can look even at these instances for which we previously didn't have a theoretical prediction and, and very accurately tell apart whether they're satisfiable or not. Going back to the variable data case and building these hierarchical models, I can end up with much better predictions than I was able to make before by leveraging these classifiers that predict satisfiability status. So there was like 60% of the instances in those blobs? Or? It depends on how far you want to go, right? I don't know whether you think it's interesting kind of out here, but... Uh, but so it's better than half, but not all. That's right. Yeah. And you know, we do very much better on some other instance distributions. This is really the hardest one at the, the fixed ratio. So I've kind of now motivated everything I've had to say. Yeah, Uri. <laughs> we used a, again, I, I'm kind of not of the opinion that the machine learning method matters a whole lot. We used something called SMLR. Uh, basically, we wanted something that was able to predict a continuous value rather than just classifying. So we wanted basically some kind of probabilistic regression. You could use something like logistic regression as well. And that had hundreds of features. That had the same set of features that I talked about before. And we can make those small, but we can't make them single feature. So, so now I want to go beyond uniform random three set. That really hasn't been the focus of our work, but I thought it was a good kind of entry point to speaking to you. So now I want to give you a very high level sense of what else we've done. So going beyond uniform random three set, we've shown that this kind of modeling works very consistently across a wide range of domains. So we, thought, we started out thinking about combinatorial auctions. We moved to satisfiability because it was a better studied domain. And then more recently, we thought about mixed integer programming and travel, very recently traveling salesman problems. Over the years, we've looked at dozens of solvers, including state-of-the-art black box commercial solvers in each domain. Dozens of different instance distributions, including benchmarks that the community cares about and real-world data that people have come to us with. 
And uh, we've also thought about different machine learning methods. And at this point, I'll switch gears and tell you that, in fact, we think that if you were going to do this now, you would want to use a method called random forests of regression trees. I don't have time to tell you about exactly how this works, but I'd be happy to tell you what it is offline. Uh, I'll show you in, on future slides how uh, the ridge regression performs against the random forest, and you can see what kind of difference it makes. So uh, on satisfiability, I'm just going to show you some examples of how well we do. And this is uh, current unpublished work that Frank just uh, generated a couple months ago. So this is looking at uh, hardware verification data generated by IBM to try to prove that they don't have bugs in their chips, like the Pentium bug, and uh, a, a solver called Spear, which is optimized for this kind of instance. And here's how we can do with linear regression, and here's how we can do with random forests. Uh, so you can see linear regression is still doing awfully well, but in particular, there's a bunch of instances here that uh, all capped, that were too hard, and so I wasn't able to measure what the run times were. And we did a lot worse in predicting those ones, for example. Um, here also is the root mean squared error of the model uh, on test data for both of these two things, so you can compare them numerically. I'll do that throughout. This is uh, data from the SAT competition, which is uh, a competitive uh, evaluation of SAT solvers that's run every two years by the SAT community. And it's a really heterogeneous set of data. In fact, they have three tracks, and we just folded everything together and ran it with one solver. And here again is how well we do. Mostly I want you kind of to look at these plots and get the sense that you know, this really does work. It's not perfect, but it's working from one domain to another. So uh, for the most part, I won't break down each of these plots. Uh, here's what happens on a mixed integer programming. The top picture is MIPLIB, which is a really hard case because it's very heterogeneous and many of the different uh, examples have very few instances. So uh, this one's pretty hard to learn from. And you can see with very heterogeneous data like this, linear regression starts to fall down. It starts having some catastrophically bad outliers, which leads it to have a really terrible root mean squared error, whereas the random forests actually do pretty well. Uh, the one on the bottom is again looking at CPLEX, which is the state-of-the-art commercial MIP solver, and uh, predicting runtime on um, some computational sustainability data that tries to decide the best way to spend government money to preserve habitat for the red-crested woodpecker. And uh, this is probably the best result I've ever seen. Uh, this means that uh, we really ought to be able to preserve some woodpecker habitat, so that's good. Uh, or at least we can predict that we can't. Um, and, and finally, this is looking at uh, traveling salesman problems. Uh, here, the difference between the two models is less uh, profound. And in fact, sometimes ridge regression is doing a little bit better. I think this is because we've been thinking about this um, domain for the smallest amount of time. And so we don't really have good features for this domain. We have good enough features to give you the results that you see here. But I think we could make them better. Uh, but again, sort of the overall thing I want you to see here is that using uh, various very different and real kinds of problem domains, using real state-of-the-art solvers, it, this is just kind of working again and again. And this is pretty representative. In fact, this is sort of one of our worst results here. So we really can just do this again and again. Now, there's one last thing I want to tell you before I conclude, and that's about modeling algorithm design spaces. So many solvers like CPLEX have large numbers of different free parameters that can be set by the user. And you can think of these parameters as defining a space of different algorithm designs rather than kind of a single algorithm. And you could hope to build a model that doesn't talk only about a single algorithm, but that talks about this whole space of algorithms spanned by a particular solver. And so that's something we've now started to think about under a really general sense of what these parameters could be. So we allow the parameters to be continuous or discrete. If they're discrete, they can be ordinal or purely categorical. Many of them are Booleans that say, you know, turn on this heuristic or don't. Some of them are continuous, except they also have a magic auto setting that does something else. They're really whatever kinds of parameters are given to us by the solver. And some of them are even conditional on other parameters. So there might be a parameter that does nothing unless one parameter takes the value of true, in which case it does something. So we can take you know, really arbitrary parameters that essentially talk about the design problem that the solver uh, engineer had. And we can build models that, that talk about uh, how we do both across different instances and across different solvers. And these are useful both for understanding hardness of an instance distribution in a bit of a more general sense. So you might criticize what I was doing before because it speaks only about one solver. And here again, I'm not speaking about solvers that no one ever thought of before, but I'm at least speaking about sort of broad spaces of solvers that people did think about before. 
And it's also really practical for choosing a solver design that you actually want to use in practice. So you can just lay down all of these parameters for your design problem, and then you can use a kind of iterative machine learning approach that sort of explores the parameter space being guided by these kinds of models. And statisticians call this sequential model-based optimization. So here's the last results I want to show you. Sorry, yeah. An example would be like, what do you have in mind as a canonical example of this? Like Cplex with different kind of uh, branch inbound? Technique? Right, so well, we actually have a, uh, a grant with Cplex right now. We're collaborating with them on this. And Cplex has 63 parameters that control um, solution strategy rather than solution quality. And the people who built Cplex really don't know, obviously, what all combinations of these things do. And so, you know, they're wondering, is it the case that for a particular application domain, you know, you really ought to have set these things very differently from the way that the Cplex default sets them. And, you know, indeed, we've been able to show to them that in some cases, you really want to set them very differently and you can get vastly better performance. And so, you know, they're thinking of shipping with Cplex a tool that lets you show it some of your data, runs this kind of optimization procedure on it, and then it kind of spits you out a new Cplex that does much better. And, and our, ourselves, again, across many domains, we've had a lot of success with improving solvers, beating the current state of the art just by finding new points in existing design spaces. So here's, uh, I guess today though, I'm trying to focus on the accuracy of the models. So here's how well we do looking now. Every one of these points is both an unseen instance and an unseen point in the parameter space. So this is, each of these is the runtime of kind of a solver that I never got to see in my training data, running on an instance that I never got to see in my training data, but coming out of this space that I know about. And uh, I'm, these are two different distributions that I already told you about to make things a little easier to describe. So this is, again, that hardware verification data. Um, and uh, here is the uh, MIPLIB data for CPLEX. And uh, again, sort of the overall point that I'd like you to take from this is just that this is possible to do at all. So I'm really able to build a, a very small and simple model that I can evaluate almost instantaneously that gives me pretty accurate predictions about how these solvers I've never seen before are going to do on instances I've never seen before. And that means there really is information, um, structural information about the instance that can be encoded in such models, and I think that should be exciting for this community. So in summary, I've told you about empirical hardness models. This is a statistically rigorous approach to characterizing the difficulty of solving families of problems using available methods. Um, we were very surprised to see how effective these were in practice uh, and indeed how robust their effectiveness is. We've really never seen them fail catastrophically. Um, and I believe that the analysis of these models can open up new avenues for investigation into theory beyond the worst case. Um, we often think about empirical hardness models not just kind of for these theoretical reasons, but also because of their usefulness in practical applications. And although that's not the focus of what I'm saying today, I'd like to just kind of call out some practical applications. The first is job scheduling. If you want to run a whole lot of machines on a cluster and you, you care about something like MakeSpan, it might make a lot of sense to quickly predict how long each of them will take so you can order them better. Um, we've had a lot of success with automatically designing algorithm portfolios. So if you have many algorithms for solving a given problem with uncorrelated runtimes, you can make a runtime prediction about each one and then simply run the one that's pr uh, predicted to be fastest. And for the last three iterations, my group has been winning the SAT competition by taking other people's SAT solvers and making predictions about which one will do best and running the best predicted one. And even though everyone else is innovating with new SAT solvers, we're able to beat the new solvers on data we haven't seen before. And I think you know, this doesn't show that we're clever. I think it shows that there's really something there to, to thinking about this kind of modeling. Uh, you can also automatically synthesize hard benchmark distribution. So if you have a distribution that varies in hardness, you can use these models to automatically focus on harder regions. And finally, as I mentioned before, a little bit uh, in response to Tim's question, you can do model-based solver tuning or design. So thanks for your attention. Does it matter 
like the, this thing came from a uniform case or that it came from something else. So it's, you know, it's a uniform random one. These are the things that they that determine are this for one from this other domain. It's these other other kind of things. So, so my sense is that it, it really does matter. I mean, we already know, for example, the reason the site competition is split into these tracks is that vastly different solvers work well on the different tracks. So even kind of different solution strategies are really important to doing well on these large circuit verification instances rather than sort of hard uniform instances. Uh, actually, these portfolio methods, I think, are the first we know of that kind of do well across the board, and only sort of by cheating, by really having all these other strategies in them. Um, so, so kind of the, the superficial answer to your question is yes, I think it really matters. Um, going a little deeper, the same set of features, which we kind of came up with by brainstorming on a whiteboard for two days, have stood us well for a decade. So the same kind of structural properties seem kind of sufficient to span the space, although I wouldn't trust a model trained on one kind of instances generally to speak about another. So I think we have the, the right ingredients across the whole space, but I think you know, in the details it really doesn't matter. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, so actually, that was what led us to, to think about this in the first place. We had an instance generator that was really widely used. People complained it was too easy, and we wanted to understand whether it was, but it, but it aimed to be really realistic. So we wanted to know, you know, is it the case that realistic problems are easy, and that's why it's easy, or did we kind of screw up in the parameters we set in this thing, and there really was a way to make it harder? Um, so we thought, well, let's just kind of do some machine learning to see what the lay of the land in this generator actually is. And, and we found that it just worked much better than we thought. We, we went off in this other direction. But, but when we kind of came back to the question of looking at these generators, it, it's possible to do basically an important sampling kind of technique where you sample from an inst the, the free parameters in an instance generator, and then you keep things uh, in proportion to their predicted hardness. And that effectively induces a new distribution which skews towards hardness. Exactly. So yeah, we would suggest doing it with respect to a whole portfolio rather than with respect just to a single algorithm. I, I think it makes sense if you're interested in focusing your attentions on doing things that existing methods can't do. So if I'd like to give out kind of a distribution of instances that is sort of a doing well on this as a certificate for doing well against the state of the art, then kind of building this thing against the portfolio makes sense. I was like everything. Oh, there was one more question. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a good and a hard question. I, I think, uh, I guess I sort of see the, the, the community that aims to build sort of high performance heuristic algorithms as sort of as a whole being an evolutionary process that's trying to, to figure out what strategies kind of in the design space work well, you know, really attacking the kind of hardness that we care about. So I think these algorithms tend to be sort of lean and mean. They don't, they don't have a random variable that talks about the stopping time. You know, they, they do kind of everything that can be done to really clamp down the runtime. And I think you know, it, it might indeed tell us something that these kinds of models work well on those sorts of state-of-the-art state algorithms, even though, of course, we know we can make algorithms that would be unpredictable. Um, I think uh, clearly it's the case that I'm only speaking about solvers. Right? There, there's no way that this kind of method can generalize to sort of unthought of solving strategies. And that's just sort of too bad, but it's the, it's the case with empirical work. But I guess for me, the fact that this has just kept working so reliably it tells me that there's some kind of pattern there. At least there's a pattern in all of the sorts of solution methods that, that anybody knows about now. And, and maybe the, the PMP question will be resolved by some you know, entirely new idea that nobody's thought about. But if that's not true, I think it's the case that this is pointing the way to, to some kind of underlying structure. I don't know how satisfying that answer is, but it's the best I can do. I promise to be quick. So, so suppose um, I'm trying to uh, uh, come up with a model somehow to succinctly summarize uh, the features of uh, real data from this particular domain of PSP. Uh, 
Are there any recommendations, for example, suppose running uh, your learning software and it will somehow uh, help the theoretician to say this could be the nature of the input that uh, somehow uh, correlated with the observation, either it's easier to solve or much challenging. Well, so that's, uh, that's why I showed you those variable importance analyses for, for the uniform random preset. Um, those uh, variable importance methods are completely automated, and you know, we've made that code available. So um, th that's, that's what I would do personally. I would take, uh, take a model that works, and I'd look at you know, how many features can I strip away from that model and keep it working? What's the very smallest model I can build that still works? And at that point, you know, typically my experience has been I can make models between about three and six features that work maybe within 90% of the accuracy of the full model. And then I can uh, ask uh, for each of those three to six features, how much did it cost to drop that from my three to six feature model? They're at that point pretty uncorrelated. And that tells me something about their relative importance, but they're really all pretty important. And then kind of the theorizing has to happen, right? Then I have to look at those three to six features and ask myself, what is this telling me about uh, the underlying structure of my instance? You know, um, the, the factor graph keeps cropping up again and again. You know, these two things keep interacting with each other. Uh, there have been cases where we've really thought hard about that in our past work and for particular domains have gained some kind of insight, but you know, that's, that's the place where there isn't going to be some kind of off-the-shelf method. You just really have to look at those models and you know, try, to, try to gain some understanding from them. 